There's a question from Christian saying, hello, any advice for a student who has complained of over-practicing high and D major first movement? First of all, I don't know if that's quite possible to over-practice first movement of high and D major, but um, it says, how can he go deeper changing perspectives away from mastering the technical commands? Uh, deeper, changing perspectives away from mastery. I'm not quite sure if I understand the question. Um, I would say in order to keep playing it fresh is to, you know, practice different bowings, practice different dynamic schemes. I recommend the same thing uh, with Haydn, with Bach also, just making sure that um, you have different perspectives playing the piece. I like to come back to a piece several times and have different um, ideas and then settle on something that, that works for me uh, at the moment. Um, and then I try to stick with it because I think any time that you uh, experiment, a lot of times when you experiment too much, you don't come up with a particular uh, version that's convincing. So um, I would say variety is really important to make sure that uh, you keep playing it fresh. And, you know, Haydn D major is just a very, very difficult piece. Um, a lot of arpeggios, the scalar activity, it's very exposing. So, um, as I said jokingly earlier, I don't think it's really quite possible to over-practice it to feel comfortable with um, all the positions. So I hope that helps. Okay, um, question from Rosia. Would you please share a bit on Channing Robin's personality and his approach with his students? Um, well, Channing, as many of you know, was uh, Leonard Rose's assistant for, oh gosh, I don't know how many years, but many, many years. And um, he was a perfect complement to, to Leonard Rose. Rose was uh, the consummate player, as I'm sure uh, many of you know. He was my hero growing up. The sole reason why I wanted to begin the cello, I heard that sound, and I just thought, wow, if I could ever recreate something like that, how inspiring. Um, and, and Channing was a student of his. They were peers as far as um, age went. But I think what Channing's um, forte was that he really had a great way of explaining things without having to demonstrate. Because he, he, he wasn't a huge player, um, but he had such a great way of inspiring people to, uh, to practice things well. And uh, that was the nice balance between Mr. Rose and, and Mr. Robbins is that you had, you know, the incredible performer and then you had all of the ideas implemented technically by um, Mr. Robbins. So, okay, uh, next question is from Michael. And the question is, what is the best warm up to exercise for sound quality? Well, you may have remembered from the last cello chat I did that I, I spoke about um, my warm up, and a lot of that just uh, involves slow, patient practice. <laughs> The best way to get great sound quality is to take the left hand out of it. So absolutely no vibrato when you're just beginning because um, you really hear how the bow is feeling, the good contact with the string, how everything's ringing. Um, so I would add vibrato after the fact. Definitely still in your warm-up because you need to start slowly with your vibrato and slowly gain momentum with that and strength. Um, but I like to do all of that with my warm up before I start playing repertoire because uh, having a nice sound is is exclusive of the repertoire. It's something that you can just do with your scales and feel like you're producing a beautiful sound without having the pressure of playing repertoire. Let's say. Okay. Uh, next question is from Jacob. He says, "Could you give us any?" thoughts on how we can adapt fast to different conditions and sizes of concert halls and rooms. Since we mostly play in our living rooms these days, yes, I understand that. I felt like I've lost a feeling for bigger rooms when I had the possibility to perform in a, a bigger room lately. 
Um, yes, I, I totally understand the fact that there's a lot of monotony in you know, facing the same screen all the time, having the same distance, sitting on the same chair. Um, my, I guess my philosophy, philosophy as far as that goes is uh, just to try to vary as much as you can in your living space. So if you are able to practice in different rooms in your house, if you're able to practice on different size chairs, tall versus shorter, um, the advice I give to everyone when they come to me to play, uh, prepare for orchestra auditions, um, is to do exactly what you're talking about. Because you don't know if you're playing for the committee in a room versus the hall. Uh, you're not sure what kind of chairs they're going to have, whether the room's going to be hot or cold. So I really suggest, highly suggest, that you try to vary your uh, environment as much as possible. That way you'll never be surprised by anything that they throw at you. Um, and one of those things is playing right in front of a wall as opposed to having tons of space. Because you have to get used to the variance in how sound comes back to you. That's how you adjust um, many things, dynamic level clarity and your vibrato, for instance, um, how it fills up a room with sound. I hope that helps. Um, okay. Then next question it's from Sarah. How does one find out the right fingering for Haydn D major? Is there a specific publishing version you recommend? You know, Sarah, that's kind of a... It's a, a loaded question because uh, my first question, my first answer would be, you know, go with the fingering that your teacher's giving you, <coughs> excuse me, because they are your mentor right now and they know you're playing best. Um, I have a whole set of fingerings that I have on PDF files that I give my students uh, on a regular basis, uh, ranging from, you know, sonatas, concerti, chamber music, everything. Uh, I do not necessarily make them play my bowings and fingerings. Uh, it really depends on what their fortes are. Uh, if, if they are good at shifting as opposed to playing uh, you know, everything in thumb position, crossing strings, then I would suggest that they do same string fingerings because I like the way that sounds voicing-wise the best. So it really depends on the individual. Um, I, I would highly recommend you just go with your teacher's suggestion first, and then uh, your colleagues usually have something to say. I, I'm not a huge social media hound. I don't have a Facebook account. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, so doing something like this is quite odd for me. Um, but I think there's a, a large network out there that you can get a lot of suggestions from a lot of different people. Okay. Um, I do play from the, the Schott edition. Uh, it's the edition that was popular when I was growing up. Uh, I played the Feuermann and teach the Feuermann cadenza as well. Um, and then a good friend of mine uh, from Sweden who teaches at the Royal Academy in London, his name's Mats Lidstrom. He's also a composer. He wrote um, the second movement cadenza for me, which is, which is quite beautiful. So, um, okay, hopefully that was helpful. Next question from Kaila. What are some warm-ups, things, warm-ups, exercise that have helped you with intonation? Um, I think one of the things that's really important in your warm-up is that you feel by the end of your warm-up that you have great range with both your right hand and your left hand. Uh, I intimated that uh, the first time I did this cello chat that it's really important that you feel like you're limber enough to play fluidly, fast, um, just, you know, if you're doing your Kostman, So with the Kostman, one, three, two is the traditional fingering. I do two, four, three. I shift back a half step because I think it really builds this muscle. Uh, I've mentioned that to many people in the past that in order to have a really good left hand, To have a really good left uh, fourth finger, uh, you need to have strength in that fourth finger. We all know that a lot of times we like to put our third finger down because it reinforces the weight of the fourth finger. I don't think the fourth finger should be any different than the first or second finger because if it's strong enough, 
When it's independent, it can rotate on axis and give you much more variety in your vibrato. So I would highly recommend trying to build your fourth finger um, strength. Okay, good. Okay, next question is from Neeraj. How do you develop a good up bow staccato, such as in Piatti 12? Well, you've got... You've got... 14, popper 14, you know, that's one of the the first etudes that we do that has a bow staccato. That's not a flying st uh, staccato per se. It's more something where you feel the contact with the string, which I'm absolutely fine with. Maybe you can start taking that off the string. Um, what I have found is that, first of all, I don't play a lot with a bow staccato. I never took the hours on end to, to get a good one. So um, maybe I'm not the best person to ask for that. But I do know that the more time I spent on it, the easier it felt. Just the actual motion of you know, the mechanics of do you feel it in your fingers? Do you feel it in the wrist? And what's that balance like in your bow grip that you feel when you're trying to get that up bow staccato? Um, personally, I, I like the feel of a, a flying up bow staccato more. Uh, I think just the release of the sound uh, is more appealing to me. But uh, if you do an up bow staccato, I highly recommend practicing a down bow staccato with it because that really coordinates your right hand then. Okay, good. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay. Then next question from Francesca. Hello, do you have any advice on how to practice the scale passages in Beethoven A major, first movement? specifically how to get to the bow moving slowly through the string crossings? That's a great question. Um, I come across that with many people all the time. It's one of the issues in playing uh, the scales. So you'll notice with my left hand, I'm preparing extensions all the time with my left hand to get those as smooth as possible. And then with my right hand, I'm trying to anticipate those string crossing. So everything feels like it's hopefully... A... Everything's round or what you're trying to create is something that is very smooth and round with no angles. So finding the plane gradually change with the bow while preparing with the extensions with the left hand, I think those two things really help quite a bit with making that smoother, Francesca. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay, next question is from, from Mari. Um, do you have any tips on playing box suite four, especially with regards to coordination to the left and right hands? Um, yeah, you know, a lot of people like to do different fingerings. So that's, I think, a great finger if you have bigger fingers. You can see a, the, my fourth finger just didn't want to really get there. So I opt for that fingering. Of course, it's balanced between voicing. So A string. Probably sounds better, but if it's not going to be 100% there for you or even 98% there for you, I would opt for the slightly uh, safer fingering. You know, choosing good fingerings and bowings, it's, it's really, it's a balance. And um, those who know me know I like to, to do as many fingerings that sound great as possible. But on the occasion where it doesn't suit your hand, then I'm all for altering the fingering a little bit to make sure that it suits you because you know everyone's hand is made a little bit differently um, and everyone's length of their arms are different. So if we're talking about the string crossing at the very beginning, that's also a very different thing for someone who has short arms versus long arms. I think the anticipation um, with short arms is actually easier than having super long arms because as you get to the tip, that increases the, you know, the string crossing itself. So I would suggest the longer arms that you have, slightly less bow to use with those. 
Because if you get further out to the tip, you're really having to work a lot harder for those strand crossings. Okay? Okay, when you're preparing for a big event such as auditions, at what point do you stop asking for input from other people? How do you balance the outside input with building your own sense of a piece? Also a very good question. Uh, you know, it it's, depends on the personality. I know people who are really good at taking in a lot of criticism um, and are able to take little bits from different people and put it together in a way where, where it works for them. Um, I find that those who have a, uh, a strong sensibility as far as what their instincts are and how they trust their instincts, that uh, follow your instincts more than what you get from the end. If you hear the same thing from a lot of people, so I would suggest that you get a lot of feedback early on. So you hear, oh, oh, well, if I'm, you know, everyone hears that shift in Brahms too, then I guess I need to work on getting that shift smoother. Um, that's definitely something you need to work towards. Um, having the knowledge and working on it and then trusting your instincts, that I would say is the most um, convincing way to play in an audition. Again, as I was saying, referring to the Bach and the Haydn earlier, if you have a lot of different ideas, especially with excerpts, when they go by so quickly, it's hard to have a very convincing, you know, 15, 20 second excerpt that you're playing. So um, get the input early on, learn how to play everything where everything feels like it's solid, and then present yourself. Uh, I think. Uh, the worst thing to do is go into an audition and feel like you're trying to please everyone all the time. That, that really doesn't work because then you're not playing with confidence that way. Okay, good. Next question. Can you talk about sound production? How to find power in the sound without locking in the body or restricting the resonance of the sound? It's a good question. Um, you know, it's an important thing to to feel like you're, I think, using a lot of your torso when you're playing. If you're playing from the back, so I don't have super long arms, so I, I need to actually feel as I get to the tip that I'm pulling kind of lat muscles from my back to, to strengthen my arm and then strengthen my grip position so I can get more weight into it. So it's that combined with speed and pressure that dictates my left hand, because I think my left hand has a lot to do with my sound production. Oddly enough, I think the left hand actually gives a lot to uh, the power in the sound and supports the right hand. So I, I hope you don't separate the two when you're thinking about sound production, because the left hand really does help the right hand quite a bit. Now, as far as restricting resonance goes, um, I, I think when I was playing Dvorak, it's not. If I'm playing with a lot of pressure and not a lot of speed, then that's when the left hand comes back into it again. So if you. If you move the bow more, you have more resonance naturally. Um, and then it kind of frees up the left hand. So there's a lot of variety in sound production that you can have for big sounds, that is. Okay. Claudio, how are you, Claudio? It's been a long time. Um, so question from Claudio in Berlin, sounding so great as a pedagogue colleague. What's the percentage of cello techniques versus mu musical analysis you would recommend to a bachelor versus master cello students. FE percentage of cello technique. Not quite sure I understand what that means, Claudio. Can you put it in a different way? Um, FE percentage of cello technique versus musical analysis. Well, if, I, I'm not sure what FE means, but what I would just take based on what you're saying, uh, younger versus older students, uh, again, I think of the younger students as more of the sponges than the older students. Uh, 
you know, generally, oh, for example, thank you. Um, the older students, I find, are slightly less malleable for less of the lack of a, a great word than the younger students. And it really depends on what kind of habits are instilled in, um, in the older versus the younger students. I would say the musical analysis is always there. Uh, I think that's something that we need to make sure that young people are always uh, putting before anything else. The number of lessons that I hear from people saying that, oh, you know, my left hand this, my left hand that, I do a lot of popper, a lot of etudes. I'm thinking, are you thinking about what your right hand's doing? It's like, I keep on missing the shift. I think, are you thinking about what your right hand's doing during the shift? It's like, shifting is more right hand to me than left hand. It's like, this only moves because this tells it where to go. So um, I think the way we think as technical cellists, we need to shift our, our, our head weight from our left hand to our right hand quite a bit. Um, so I would say between the younger and the older, I would say always talking about music. And as far as the younger ones, I think, you know, going really basic early on is really important. I won't necessarily do that with the older ones because they've made it work to a certain extent at their age, which is, you know, four or five years older than the younger ones. Uh, the younger ones can change faster. And um, that's, that's the good time to just kind of shake them up and give them a lot of new technical um, advice. Uh, I tell all of my freshmen that, I'm sorry, your freshman year, your first year, it's not going to be about learning five concerti and ten sonatas. It's, it's probably about learning five lines of things just so we can actually uh, fix the things that, that you need fixing. And then it makes the second and third years and fourth years so much easier to learn rep repertoire after that. Okay. Nice to hear from you, Claudio. Uh, question from Michael. Do you have some tips for a balanced round vibrato and thumb position in higher registers? Uh, sure. My first question to you, Michael, is what, what's your thumb doing? When you're vibrating? Uh, so for me, the thumb is very crucial to be the anchor while I'm vibrating on whatever, second, first, Finger. I like to feel that the thumb is always shaping the hand and uh, taking the pressure off the actual vibrato finger so I feel like there's a nice dis distribution of weight so I can slightly adjust it and that that's based on where the thumb is. If I want the thumb to be slightly round, uh, if the vibrato to be slightly rounder, I move it closer to the finger. If I'm trying to uh, restrict the sound <laughs> then obviously I try to restrict the shape of my hand. So sometimes you want that super tight, narrow vibrato con to control your sound. That's when I start moving my thumb further back. So I hopefully, I hope that's helpful to you. Okay, next question. Personally, I find it very difficult to play notes separated by two tones above the fourth position and before thumb position, such as playing G, A, B on the A string with fingers one, two, three. I end up using the fourth finger for the B, but the position is not stable and the sound not satisfactory. Do you have any advice or exercises to suggest? Okay, so. I believe he's talking about So I, I call this area no person's land. No man's land, no person's land, no female's land, or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's it's an awkward position because you don't have um, you don't have a foundation, basically. You can use your thumb back here, you use your thumb up here, but how do you use your thumb here? That's that's the question. So you're talking about using full. Again, if you do that Kostman and you strengthen that finger, I guarantee you that fourth finger is going to feel a lot better than it does right now. Um, 
But if you're not just... If you're not going to use your fourth finger, you want to use your third finger. I bring my thumb, you can see where my thumb is kind of right on the G, it's back on the A. It starts coming off a little bit. And then by the B, it's totally off. And if you can see the shape of my hand, I'm not sure if it's so clear since it's not three dimensional. Um, I'm trying to create an arch in my hand so I could rotate my hand. Um, that way, the finger that is on the string, that's the fulcrum, and I can rotate around that finger. So regardless of one, two, or three, as I get closer to the end of my hand, when I bring up my thumb, that actually balances between thumb and three better. So ideally, I'm trying to find something where between all of these fingers, excuse me, that my thumb is still actively shaping my hand position. Um, and for me, I find that's where all the solidity comes from. That if I... That if I'm able to put equal weight on each finger, then think about it, your hand does need to rotate. So for the thumb, I call that an air anchor because it's still an anchor for me. It's in a fixed position, but I feel like I'm in a stable fixed position when I'm vibrating on three. So I think it, the same would be for four as well. So I hope, hope that's helpful also. Okay, next question. Uh, how has been your experience playing with Pinkett Zuckerman? <laughs> Could you share more about what you were able to learn from him? Uh, boy, if I could, I can't count, you, we'd be here all day if I could tell you the amount of things that I've, uh, I learned from Pincus. Uh, just the consummate musician. Um, I think you may have remembered those who were here when I did the cello chat uh, last May that partially it was a tribute to one of my former teachers, Lynn Harrell. Um, Lynn actually told me, we were talking about Pinky when I started playing chair music with Pinky, and he said, Pink is Zuckerman, without a doubt, the greatest instrumentalist that has ever lived. Um, that's quite a statement coming from one of the greatest <laughs> instrumentalists. Uh, of course, there are so many great, great instrumentalists. You can't really just, you know, say that. You, you can justify it in a lot of ways, and you can believe that. And he surely believed it, and I believe it too. I, I don't think he's sounding any uh, less than he did 30 years ago. Uh, I played Schubert Quintet with him a, a few years ago, and it was still like the greatest fiddle playing I've ever heard in my life. Um, we talk about sound, uh, and Rose, who was my hero, certainly sound-wise, so many ways. Um, he, he talked about, Pincus, that is, about Rose as if that was the greatest sound he ever heard. And, you know, if you're talking about two of the giants talking about great sound, Wow, what a what a mountain to climb to try to get a sound like these guys. Uh, that's that's a great uh, great goal to try to try to get. Anyway, so musically, um, I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, we were on tour. I think we were in um, Israel at the time, and we were playing uh, piano quartets, piano quartets, string trios, things like that for all of these programs that I played with them. And then on occasion, we would do an encore of, let's say, Last Moon of Schumann Piano Quintet. And so right before we would start, he would just lean in and tell everyone, Misha Elman. We're like, okay. And then he, he would play the whole last movement in the style of Misha Elman. And then he would say, Yasha Heifetz one the next time. Or he would say, D David Oistroff. And it was the most incredibly, uh, incredible learning experience to me that here is someone that has such an amazing style on their own that can play like virtually anyone. Think about how much uh, skill that takes to, and understanding to be able to imitate someone's idiosyncrasies on that level. Uh, it was just mind blowing. And so, if I could take anything from that, it would be, wow, if I could just take one-tenth of any of these great people, wouldn't it be a great uh, you know, attribute to have? 
So maybe something to think about is that as you're shaping, especially the young people, as you're shaping your style, maybe borrowing a little bit from here and there, um, you know, to, to find your own style, because if you can take anything from the greats, they were or are great for a reason, so. Okay, good. Uh, next question. Have you had any experiences with rehabilitation of the ul ulnar nerve issues? Uh, I, I believe you're talking about here or helping students rehabilitate. Just wondering if you have any exercises you would recommend. Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not the person to ask. Uh, fortunately, I have not been injured with an ulnar nerve. Uh, my brother, who's a f fabulous violinist, Benny, he um, has dealt with ulnar nerve issues for a while. He got hit, we were at a restaurant in New York, and he got hit in his ulnar nerve. Um, and he, it's really affected his fiddle playing uh, at times over the years because you know it pops up. It, from what I understand, it's not always 100% there all the time, so you have to be ready for it. Um, I know for him it was just a lot of acupuncture. I know, I don't want to necessarily tell you to do that, but I, there was a fantastic person in Santa Fe that uh, he's been to that helped him quite a bit. Um, and I think rest has helped it quite a bit. So not pushing it um, and following your doctor's recommendations, I, I think those are always really important things. So unfortunately, I did not have that uh, experience. So I'm sorry I can't help you with that. But um, I wish you the best with that. So, a uh, question from Shanae. Hello, Shanae. How do I play forte on the C string without creating the buzzing sound? Uh, I think the buzzes happen because the string touches the fingerboard as it vibrates. Uh, for example, third movement of the Rachmaninoff. So you're talking about that passage. I often see people pull the string into the fingerboard because it's so far away when you're playing on the C string that you actually need to rotate a little bit further. So in essence, I actually feel like I'm pushing the C string away and playing right on top of the string and feeling like my forearm sure that I have good clearance here so I can get a good amount of weight on my fourth finger pushing out. So I think part of it, there are some physical things that could be an issue with your instrument also. The scoop on the C string, which is the, the drop off, the way your uh, fingerboard is planed. Um, this, this is something I learned from Mr. Rose and then also Mr. Harrell is that having a really good sharp drop off between the G string and the C string really helps with being able to play more on the C string without getting the buzz you're talking about. But then also the phenomena of not pulling the string in, um, especially if you have a shorter arm or smaller hands, that the, the temptation to pull is there. So pushing away, I think it will really help and also feeling like you're playing more on top of the string, pushing it away. Hopefully that will help you, okay, good. Uh, next question, any advice on using vibrato at the beginning of Schumann Concerto? Well, let me ask you, so this is from Christian. Um, that's a very popular question. I, I find a lot of people are saying, you know, my vibrato just doesn't sound. I guess, wh what are you looking for? Are you looking for something that is distant? Something that's more present? I think a lot of your immediate attitude when you play that E comes from the right hand. Here we go again, we're talking about vibrato. 
But uh, again, I'm talking about start it. <sighs> If you can't get the sound without vibrato, then any vibrato you use after that's not really going to help you. So then if once you feel like you're getting that nice, good focus sound, then experiment. Speed and width, those are the two things that you can control with your left hand. And then speed and pressure of the right hand. So you have all of those variables that create the, the atmosphere and the character that you're looking for. So uh, again, a great many um, variables that, that you can experiment with, experiment with to get the right color in sound. Okay, okay next question. At an orchestra audition, how do you maintain focus when getting through to further rounds? That's a good question. Uh, boy, there are a lot of variables there. Um, you know, it depends what time the audition started. Are you doing all of your rounds in the same day? Um, so why don't I address the most obvious scenario, which is three rounds in one day. Which is, which used to happen. I'm not sure if it happens so much anymore. But let's say that you have to play a preliminary, a semifinal, and a final all in one day. I'm guessing you have to start fairly early in the day um, for your preliminary. So, depending on how much you played and how you played in the preliminary, um, that should dictate what happens from round to round. I never would suggest thinking about, okay, I made it through the first round. What am I going to do for the finals? Well, don't think about the finals yet. You're not in the finals yet. Um, think about how you can actually just feel like you're improving all the time. This is not just auditions. This is when you're playing recital. You've got four or three pieces that you're trying to knock down. Um, you're trying to play everything great, but maybe the, you're choosing a piece that starts a recital or let's say your concerto for an audition that's going to settle you down a little bit. Um, this is something that's a little bit different than in an orchestra audition when giving a recital. I have a very good friend who was big soloist in the 70s, had a short-lived career but town hall debut, uh, recordings with Columbia Records and uh, I asked him, you know, what made him comfortable playing a full recital? He said, well, you know that phenomena, Eric, when uh, things are going so well, you just wonder when you're going to make a mistake? I said, yeah, I've had that on occasion where it felt like it's going that well. Um, he said, you know, I, I just get rid of that. I just make intentionally a mistake in the first minute of my recital so I don't have to worry about when it's going to go bad. And so I can focus the rest of the time on, on just playing like me. There's something to be said for that because um, anytime you pick up the instrument and you're playing for people, there's, there's your mind that, that has to be in the right place for you to be able to present yourself and to, um, to actually feel like you can do everything you need to do from the beginning until the end. Now, this is kind of a strange segue. I will get back to the orchestra audition thing, but uh, I had a funny thing with my studio this week. Um, they, they presented me with a T-shirt. From time to time, from studio to studio, they like to come up with these T-shirts that have, you know, something I said, or, you know, I guess there are a few things that I always say, so they'll put it on a T-shirt. But this T-shirt had a picture of a bow on the front, and it had a quote of mine, and the quote says, there is no light at the end of the tunnel, unquote. Eric Kim, 2020. Okay, so if you don't know it in context, that sounds pretty dub Debbie Downer, right? Sounds very pessimistic and really uh, bad. Take it out of context, it sounds really bad, but the context is, is that um, I always tell my, my students that when you start messing up towards the end of a piece, it's because you see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
And this is the same thing for an audition, any solo you're playing. So I, I just tell them, I say, listen, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, meaning just keep your focus the whole time. So this is the same thing what you're talking about with uh, taking an orchestra audition. You make it through the first round and you think, oh, and then the back of the t-shirt I should tell you was hashtag less bow. Because I think a lot of times people just use way too much bow all the time. So that's it with the t-shirt. Okay, so um, the orchestra audition. So you make it through the first round, second round. So all I, I could tell you in Cincinnati, we would have like five minute prelim when I was there. Um, we'd play exposition of classical concerto, usually high D or C. Play maybe first page uh, through the second theme and then play second movement, Beethoven five. Um, Melson Scherzo, uh, either N to O or C to D, uh, Debussy La Mer. And then if you were on the border, you got to play the first eight bars of Don Juan, and that dictated you go into the second round. Okay, the second round was only excerpts, about 10 excerpts. Verdi Requiem, uh, Chike 4, Brahms 2, all of these things. So mentally, you're thinking, okay, so they don't want to hear a solo the second round, but they want to see you know, what kind of uh, soldier I am. You know, do I play with good rhythm? Do I play lyrically when I need to? All of these things are super important when you're uh, taking audition. So that should be your focus, is that you have a goal with every one of those excerpts, and your goal is to get through everything and maintain music through each one of them. I, I tell everyone on a regular basis that, you know, someone out there that can play all of the, it's, there, there are tons of guys females, whatever. There are all kinds of individuals that play everything great. The question is, does Debussy sound like Debussy? And then does Verdi sound like Verdi after? Does Brahms sound like that? You know, style. So maintaining style is a very, very big thing when you're taking auditions. So there are a lot of things to consume your mind that has nothing to do with, you know, what happens later that, that can keep you in the game, if you will. And then for the final round, that's always the worst because that's when you start thinking, oh, I made the finals. Oh, I better check out real estate here. Where do I want to live? You know, can I afford this house? Oh, I think, you know, maybe what's the cost of living like here? You know, how, what's the restaurant scene like? You know, things like that. It's like, don't even think about any of that. To remain focused, you know, just assume that you're not going to get it and you have to play your best. Um, you know, maintaining your your poise along the way. But I would say focusing on music and the reason why you, you know, undertook the audition in the first place is because you want to play in a great orchestra, I'm assuming. So that you have to maintain all the way through the process. So sorry, it was a long answer. Okay, next question. Okay. Less technical question, can you please share a story of someone in your past who helped you in an unexpectedly profound way? Uh, boy, I don't know if I can choose just one. There, are, there have been so many uh, fantastic influences in, in my life that uh, I'd be hard pressed to choose one over the other. Let's just say that um, I had a lot of help. I think you need to feel like you've got a lot of support to uh, do well in music. Um, I, I tell my kids all the time that, not my children, I don't have children, dogs. Um, my students that, it, first of all, it takes an incredible amount of um, inner fortitude and fight to be able to have a career in music. Um, you need that first and foremost, but then you need support. You need people behind you, whether it's emotionally, financially, um, you know, to always lift you up when you're down because it, it's too difficult to try to do this um, on your own. So I would say if you can garner support as much as possible, that helps a lot 
when you're not feeling your, your best. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, next question. Okay, any tips on ways to approach strings with left hand without having an iron arm tiring and hurting? Any tips on ways to approach strings with the left hand? Not quite sure if I understand that uh, wholly, but um, maybe if you're talking about left hand articulation, uh, building strength and not getting tired with, um, with that. Again, I, th I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, finger exercises. So we talked about Kosman is wonderful for finger strengthening. The Foyard exercises are also quite good for finger strengthening. So if you just want to take things out of context that have nothing, you know, if you want to take musically everything out of it, um, then maybe all of the finger type exercises uh, could help you gain strength. I'm not quite sure what your question meant, but I think it's basically saying um, that you're trying to build strength with your left hand because you have um, a lot of issues with exhaustion and pain. Uh, scales. And then the last kind of technical thing I want to add to that is that uh, I talk a lot about the the left elbow height. Um, I think the height of the elbow is such an important aspect that we're not always um, cognizant of. Uh, I like a slightly higher elbow in general because what I find is that uh, it puts me in a more ready position when I go into thumb position. Now, if you feel like you're playing everything in first position and you can hang your arm down, then that's great. But I want every one of you that doesn't think about your elbow position, I want you to consider what it's like when you play with a slightly higher elbow position when you're about ready to shift into thumb position. Now, does that mean that you have to come down from here to here for it to be smooth? Well, feel what that does with the tension in your hand and your finger, the weight, the actual weight. I guarantee you that you'll feel when you bring up that elbow that the, the amount of weight in your fingers will be much lighter and will be more consistent with the weight that you're arriving on for your shift. So doesn't it make sense that balance-wise you want to feel something that's very consistent in the process? That takes away the fear between point A and point B. I think, I think you've, it feels more like a smooth process um, shifting. I, I think shifting is one of the most difficult things that we, we try to tackle. So um, trying to find that good balance, I think that helps with, with pain and tension if you're not trying to give too much weight into your hand position itself. Yeah, good. Um, next question is, what tips do you have on developing variance in speed and width with vibrato? Well, I have a, a vibrato exercise uh, that I give to all of my students, and um, I can briefly talk about that. It's not in thumb position, so that's a totally different uh, set of mechanics, I would say. But what I like to do is give um, vibrato in first position, starting with one. You just choose one speed, one width. It can be anything to begin with. Uh, something that's very comfortable. So kind of medium speed, medium width. And you start with one or start with whatever your favorite finger is. Might be two. I like to start with one because I like to go in progression. Because in general, you go from most comfortable to least comfortable, right? Um, so starting with one, matching the vibrato on two with what you just heard with one, three with two, and four with three. So inevitably, you're going to get the same vibrato with every finger. I mean, that's that's the goal anyway, right? So you just choose. So 
So if you're able to do that, which that's a lot of years, by the way, in trying to, to get that to sound even. Um, so don't expect it to happen overnight. But it's a good goal to feel like you can control the same speed and width from finger to finger. Because think about how many times you're playing uh, a tune within the same position or you just kind of leave the position a little bit. And then you have to use all four fingers in that lyrical passage. But the vibrati all sound different because you can't control the speed and width. So this is there so you can actually control the speed and width. So once you're able to do that, then I start alternating the fingers. So, okay, so now I, that feels really good in first position. Next position, starting on the D. So now I'm going for a fast, narrow vibrato. Same thing with... And then I start with a different vibrato. And I start on the F there. So I'm doing B through D. D through F, F through A flat G sharp. And the reason why I do it from the F is that I like that little extra half step that takes us out of fourth position. It kind of makes the fourth finger even more important to have strength in it for it to speak clearly. So. <laughs> So if you're able to get that same width and speed in all of those three positions, think about how you've just covered all the way up to fifth position, um, alternating fingers. So hopefully, and I do that on all four strings. I give that to all four strings. What you'll find is that as you go to the thicker strings that you're going to need a deeper vibrato for the width, and you're going to find that your elbow position should get higher and higher based on how that plane changes. Okay. I hope that wasn't too too much information. So, okay. Um, next question: How do you deal with excess tension when playing double stops for an extended period of time? Well, I just spent what a good five minutes talking about elbow position. Depending on where your chords are. Um, if it's thumb position, that's, again, something very different. Um, but when I'm talking about thumb position being different is that, with, especially with vibrato, I feel vibrato mostly with my f elbow and forearm when I'm trying to get a free vibrato um, in the lower positions. When I go into thumb position... <laughs> I feel more I actually feel like my wrist is much more active in vibrato and thumb position. Um, I can I like to feel like I'm arching the wrist a little bit more. Again, thus per, uh, you know uh, getting a ball hand position so I can feel like I'm rotating more. And I, I can relax quite a bit that vibrato when I'm thumb position when I'm thinking more about the wrist. So uh, I hope that helps with your, your chords also. Um, could you please share more about the cello that you are playing on and your thoughts on modern versus antique instruments? Well, I guess um, I guess you would call my cello an antique instrument. <laughs> uh, it's made in 1707 um, by Matteo Gofriller. Uh, incredibly lucky to have this cello um, it's uh, like anyone who chooses an instrument it should be your voice and I I really f feel when I went for my previous cello which is a great cello it was a Granchino to this gofriller that it just gave me um, a million plus more ways to say things and to sing um, just really felt like it just opened up a whole new 
set of uh, characters that I could um, draw on. Um, the cello belonged to, I've had it for, what, since 06, uh, 2006 or 2005, something like that. And um, the gentleman who owned it before played in the Philadelphia Orchestra and uh, owned the cello for 57 years. And the story behind it, because I, I did talk to him after I, I bought the cello, and he was a very gracious man. Um, he told me that he was a student of uh, Piotrgorsky's, and that Piotrgorsky actually found the cello for him in London, and that's how he, he wound up with it. So, um, antique versus modern, a lot of fantastic modern instruments. Um, I, I enjoy playing them quite, quite a bit. I don't really compare the two, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm not trying to say that you know, a multi-million dollar old instrument is comparable to a $150,000 incredible new instrument. Um, they're just different. They're different animals. Um, it's, it's like trying to convince someone that, you know, an electric car is the only way to go versus gas. I have a friend in Korea, fantastic cellist, by the way, drives a really nice car, but it takes gas. And we were talking about electric cars. And I said to him, I said, man, you should get a electric SUVs are incredibly cool. He says, Eric, I love the smell of gas. So, you know, there, there's a whole different idea of what you like about an old instrument versus a new instrument. Um, but I must say that new instruments sound pretty darn good these days, and they're getting better all the time. And um, thank you to all the wonderful luthiers out there making wonderful instruments these days. Okay, uh, next question. As a professor, you have seen a lot of people go through a college audition. What do you look for in a cellist? Any tips for repertoire too? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, a common one, I would say. Uh, you've probably asked that question and had a million different answers already. Hopefully, a lot of them have been um, similar in, in response. What do we look for? Um, well, first of all, I'll tell you that I love having a relationship with someone before I take them as a student. Meaning is I, I like to see, uh, you know, well, right now it's been through Zoom, but prior also, <clears throat> excuse me, through trial lessons, that you see how someone's brain works when you're working with them. You see what kind of compatibility that you have. I think a lot of times you can see that in someone's playing, but then once in a while you can't. So after the now many years that I've been teaching, I've found that it's really helpful to, to have some sort of relationship with, um, with someone uh, before accepting them. For the audition itself, I'd like to see someone who is dedicated to their audition, meaning not someone who's just kind of wandering, looking all over the place while they're playing, but that they're very focused. I, your eyes don't have to be closed. You know, you don't have to play like a mummy. Um, you should feel natural. You should feel like who you are because you don't want to represent anything else but who you are. Um, I would say that's the, the most important thing. And I'll, I'll go back to the orchestra audition thing too. It's like people come up to me and say, oh, well, you know, I'm auditioning for Cleveland, or I'm auditioning for Chicago or New York. You know, I know in this recording they play it like this and this conductor likes it that way. You know, that may be the case, but if you don't play that way, you're not going to sound your best playing it. So I recommend that you just play everything the best that you can for your audition, show up, be the personality that you have, and you'll find your place. Uh, repertoire. Tips for repertoire. I have do's and don'ts. Um, if you're going to play Elgar, do play the fourth uh, movement. If you're going to play the first movement, do play the second move. Offer the second movement with the first move movement. I wouldn't just offer the first movement. Um, if you're playing Shostakovich, first concerto, I would say offer third and fourth movements and not the first movement. I find the first movement is just um, too much of the same thing. Uh, Rococo variations, 
A lot of times I'll hear theme through first three variations. Uh, yeah, there's enough difficulty in that, but why not offer the seventh variation also? That shows a much rounded uh, auditioning also. And then choosing your Bach, I find Bach to be so subjective that it's, it's really important that you find um, a suite or a movement or something that really speaks to you because um, it's so individualistic that it's, everyone likes the, oh, you can't take time here, or oh yeah, you can't. I remember my first lesson with Mr. Rose um, was Bach Fifth Suite, Prelude, and I played through it for him, and he says, you know, Eric, it's, that was quite beautiful, but you know, I believe Bach was a romantic. So he played the whole suite for me, my first lesson for him, and it was pretty romantic, but it was, one of the most amazing things I'd ever heard also. So, you know, just believe in how you, you, you play and I think your auditions will go well. Okay, good. Next question. Okay. Hello, Josh, how are you? Um, do you have any particular advice on effectively and efficiently practicing a long list of excerpts? As I begin to look at longer lists for professional auditions, I find that balancing them and keeping them all in shape at the same time has been a challenge without overexerting myself, especially with all the other playing commitments brought on by school, etc. That's a great question uh, that I get um, asked actually quite a bit, Josh. Uh, first of all, you got to know yourself. Uh, what are what are your best excerpts? Those aren't the ones you should be playing. Um, you know, if you play really beautifully, you do play beautifully. I, I do think you, you're a beautiful player. But um, you know, the person who plays Brahms' second uh, symphony, Brahms' third symphony, Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony, second movement, uh, Verdi Requiem, they're not necessarily always the best person that plays Don Juan or Ein Heldenleben or Bartered Bride and things like that. So. You know, know what your fortes are and know what you need to spend time on. So if technique playing fast is what you need to work on, Brahms Haydn, Fifth Variation, um, you know, Barter Bride, Don Juan, all of the Strauss excerpts, you know, pound those out and make sure that you're, you're getting your technique at the level of everything else. You're not a clean player? Practice Mozart a lot more. You know, get all of your scalar things then in order. You know, just look at your list and prioritize um, what, and this is a good idea, I recommend this a lot, is that look at your list, put them in categories, you know? Must do every day. Must not do every day. Must not do even every week because it's pretty darn good. You know, things like that. Um, being organized like that, you'll find that, you know, every third day, you'll find that you've practiced everything enough to where you're getting the level of everything closer together. And I think that's the goal when you're taking auditions, that you feel like all of your excerpts are all on the same level, which hopefully is supremely high level. Okay, so good luck with that. Okay, next question is, how can you practice in a way that carries also into a concert situation? You know, it's very interesting because um, in our studio class, uh, I often ask the student after they play how they feel. That's one of the first questions. Like, well, how did that go, so and so? Like, well, you know, it, it didn't. It just didn't go nearly as well as when I ran it through uh, for my friends, or when I played it, um, you know, half an hour before studio class. It just went so much better. Um, Say, so, oh, well, what's what was different? It's, well. You know, it was tighter. I just didn't feel like, you know, um, well, first of all, it's mostly technical things. Almost never do I hear, well, I just didn't feel like I was singing the way I wanted to. Or, you know, I, I didn't feel that, you know, my phrasing was, you know, so long. It's mostly, oh, I felt like I was tight. I was out of tune. And my sound was doing this and contact point. So I often get answers that are technically driven. Um, so I would first of all recommend when you're running through something and you're trying to practice uh, something for a performance, you got to practice performing. I tell that to, to the students all the time. Says you practice technique, you practice this. The bottom line is that 
after all that, you have to practice making music. And how do you do that? You just kind of let it go. You let it go for yourself first in the practice room. You record yourself, see if you're seeing what you want to see, then play it for someone, see if they see what you're saying, seeing, because more oftentimes that doesn't come across. Um, and then you go back to the drawing board. You're like, oh, okay, I guess I got to do more. I need to exaggerate what I'm doing for that to come out. Um, there are a lot of ways to practice performing. And I think that's an important thing that we need to do. It's not that we just practice our you know, passage work and our bowing and our vibrato, and then all of a sudden it's there. You have to practice your phrasing. You have to practice how it feels to play these passages. You don't want to be blindsided when you have to play it in front of people. And then if you're talking about a concert hall, then you have to exponentially exaggerate everything. So the person, you hear this from people all the time, person in the last person, last row. They need to understand what you're doing. And it's true. Okay, good. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, okay, we're running a little bit over. Um, maybe I'll answer one more question. How does that sound? Okay. Um, let me see, how can I increase the speed of vibrato without getting tight? Question is, um, when you're, you're playing your vibrato, do you know what muscles are active to increase the speed of the vibrato? And if you're only talking about speed and not width, then you know, I, I spoke about that earlier in the vibrato exercise. There are the variables that you need to be aware of when you increase speed. You have to know exactly if it's just speed that you're wanting to increase. Um, if it's just speed, then you can narrow down, you know, uh, you know, like I feel in my deltoid. The relaxed vibrato is pretty loose. Then I start feeling the bottom of my, or the tip of my elbow. Then I start feeling more compact with my hand position because I don't want it flopping around if I want a more narrow vibrato. So a lot of things to consider to increase speed, narrowness, width. All of those uh, variables are, are important to be able to control. Well, uh, I think that brings us to the end of our session. So I hope everyone enjoyed that and uh, hopefully you got something out of it. Okay, and it's beautiful here today. I'm going to go for a hike. So I hope you all enjoy your day. All right, take care.